My name is Alan Story from No Stump City. Um, you could sort of call No Stump City the political wing of the Sheffield Trees movement. Um, that what we do is try and reach out in independent political action and, and this kind of thing, uh, fighting around the issue of the PFIs is something when Arthur and I started the group a year ago, um, was on the very first leaflet about PFIs. This is a real problem. Um, so, and this is Dexter, we'll get to him in a minute. Um, there's a saying I read in the newspaper the other day, tribes don't win elections, coalitions do. Now, a commentator said that uh, the other day by appealing to moderates, this is what Theresa May's political strategy was, tribes don't win elections, a coalition of the moderates. <clears throat> Now, I think we've been a bit overloaded with Theresa May, a little bit overloaded with Brexit, um, but uh, I don't think she's the world's greatest political strategist, but I do think there's one, we can say one thing, that tribes can't really knock off an oppressive PFI deal by itself. Uh, but in fact, a coalition of the tribes in Sheffield could do that. So this is the first attempt really by No Stump City to try and build a coalition of the various tribes in Sheffield uh, who are opposed to the PFI deal and the Amy PFI deal in particular. Now, of course, uh, one group is the trees campaigners who are here uh, because they don't like 5,000 trees, more than 5,000 trees cut down, healthy trees, blah, 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 and the privatization of our streets that's gone on. There's some Greens here who have long been opposed to privatization, the Amy deal. Uh, the, the leader of It's Our City just sent me a, a text uh, about two minutes ago saying that sadly she can't come, but there was going to be some It's Our City people, civic activists who have called in their program for ending the PFI contract. And in fact, not as many as we'd hope, but uh, that's the future. Uh, there's Labour Party activists here as well. And the Labour Party, especially under Corbyn and McDonnell, have made it very clear that they, in fact, are deathly opposed to PFI deals. They do not want more. They want to bring things in-house. They don't want money going to tax havens. Uh, and so this is an attempt, uh, our start, of, in fact, trying to build a coalition to get Amy out of Sheffield. Now, just a few housekeeping matters. Um, this meeting uh, costs us about 200 quid. Uh, now, Snow Stump City does have some money, but not that much. Um, the money to bring Dexter in from Ireland and to, in fact, rent this room uh, cost, as I say, about 200 quid. Bo is going to be passing around, the man in the corner there, passing around his lovely hat uh, for, in fact, contributions towards the money. Um, so we hope that this is only the kickoff of the Amy Out campaign in Sheffield. And Andrea Stone, the person we affectionately call the tutor, uh, is in fact, has an e a list here to put your name on the email list. And we're going to circulate this, and those who want to keep abreast of the campaign can sign on there. And down in the corner, we have a literature table uh, that's being operated by No Stumper Isabel Baxter. Um, there's some No Stump City press releases, leaflets, our, our well-known uh, Snakes and Ladders leaflet. And in fact, this booklet here, what we're charging two quid for, uh, on um, the people versus PFI, how come we're still paying for this? It's 48 pages long, and uh, it's really, you know, it's a very good uh, primer on how PFIs operate. Uh, one other housekeeping matter, just also who was planning to come to the meeting was a woman called Sal Williams. Sal Williams and Brian Williams are people who live out in the country just past Loxley. They've been a great deal in the news recently because, in fact, um, Sheffield City Council, uh, the transport department, said they should cut down a whole bunch of flowers. They should, in fact, um, move their water butts. But of particular interest to us that they should, in fact, move 30 to 40 meters of stones lining the road beside their house. And it's been a big petition. The kids' council has given in. And I was spoken to Sal today, I just wanted to make clear they've actually given in on something which is very PFI related, which was in 2013, as part of the Street's Edge contract, Amy came up there and just piled tarmac 
all over these stones all along the side of the road. And then, in fact, two weeks ago, you know, five years later, the council then, hi, Justin, come on in. Um, five years ago, or five, uh, five, two weeks ago, the council came along and said, within one week, we want you to, in fact, get rid of, of those stones, cut your flowers down, blah, blah, blah. And now Sal uh, is going out for dinner, with a celebration dinner uh, that the council has given him completely. In fact, of a petition, I think 7,000 names, it is backed right down. But it was, in fact, showing the long-term effect of this streets ahead PFI deal on our city. Okay, I think that's all the introductions. Next is Dexter. And Dexter is the director of the European Services Strategy Unit. Um, this is sort of a bit of a homecoming for Dexter because he lived here from 1986 to 2003, in those years, um, and worked for the council and blah, blah, blah. It was really lovely, like passing out leaflets at different places. Oh, I know Dexter. I know. Dexter is a well known man in the city as a person who, in fact, working with their group to for the provision of good quality public services by accountable public bodies implementing best management practice, employment equal opportunities, and sustainable development policies. He, in fact, has worked very closely with the city of Sheffield. Uh, and he's come back to, in fact, talk to us, and we should really be happy to have him. He is really um, a world expert, and if not the world expert, and don't be shy there, Dexter, on, in fact, how to get rid of PFIs, which, in fact, that's why we're here, is how to, in fact, get rid of PFIs. So, without that, uh, that introduction, over to you, Dexter. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. for having the to the show. <laughs> right, so, uh, what I'm going to do is, is um, talk about PFI, talk about strategies, and various, uh, various other things. And that is divided into five different sections. And so, what we're going to do is uh, talk about each section, and then we'll stop the if people have got questions or anything's not clear, clarity, you know, clarifications and so on. Um, so it's trying to get information, understanding of what PFI is about, um, but also about you know having some discussion as well. So um, this is just a sort of start. I mean, I call it follow the money because, like in all these contracts whether it's outsourcing, or whether it's PPPs, other kinds of PPPs, or PFI, the key is you follow the money. <coughs> Where the money goes tells you lots of things. And it tells you about relationships um, between the council and the contractor and so on. And you know what, what we have here in the terms of this diagram, obviously we've got the city council. The city council is the client. And, um, uh, the city council wanted to repair the roads uh, and so on uh, it, 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 uh, way back in you know, 2000, well, 2008, 2007, when they started this process. Um, and you know, because of financial constraints, the government said, you, can, you, you, know, you can't borrow money on that, that kind of scale. Uh, you've got to have PFI. So it's either improved roads through PFI, or there's no improved roads. And that's exactly the same message they said to every local authority in Britain about schools and hospitals, etc. You want a new school? It's going to be PFI, or you don't get a new school. And you know, PFI became known as the only show in town. Because and, and what also happened was that you had to concoct value for money to show that PFI was the best deal. And it was like having a, a set of scales. And you had a public sector option to do it. And on the, the other side of the scale, you had a PFI option. And until the PFI option fell down to the bottom to show that that was the best value, you kept adjusting all the figures until you got the right answer. And if you didn't get the right answer, you didn't get any bloody project at all. So it was, you know, it was everybody and I said everybody in terms of local authorities, or whatever, were pushed into it, it, you know, both by conservative governments and by Labour governments. Anyway, so what we have is city, city, city council as is the is the client. We then have what we call the SPV, special purpose vehicle. It's a company. 
And um, it's, it's a project company which, in a sense, receives the money from the council um, in terms of repayments. It also receives money from pri private finance and banks and other financial institutions that you know, finance the project. Um, the SBV also, in a sense, employs the contractor and the subcontractors, i.e., in this case, Amy, and its subcontractors have been in a sense, doing work uh, on trees and on, 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 on roads. And in terms of over here, you have the, what, what are called the equity shareholders, and they're the shareholders of uh, this company. And the, the shareholders, in, in this case, we'll come on to this, I'll explain who they are. Obviously, one of them is Amy. They have got a, a third of the shareholding there. Um, and, but it's those shareholders who, in a sense, own that company, and the, the, the SPV is the, it is, is the center of all of that. So, in a sense, money is, uh, is being flowed from the council, flows uh, the repayments from the, from the council um, into the project company. Project company receives money from the private sector. The equity shareholders um, have uh, uh, certainly um, projects are financed by 90% uh, debt from the private sector, and the equity shareholders jointly put in 10% of the money. And then the SBV pays the contractors and subcontractors. So it's important to just to understand that that is a that's the system, and that is basically uh, the system for all PFI contracts. Um, the Sheffield one, the, the highways one, or Streets of Hell as it's called, you know, it's got it's a 26 euro contract, 2,000, 2.2 billion project to receive, 674 million credits from the government, what they call PFI credits. And PFI credits are, so in a sense, the government is helping to finance this project. But the credits are simply the money that the council would have got over the 25 years through subsidies that every local authority used to get for doing highways, building schools, and so on. And, um, but I don't want to go into that because it gets more complicated. But, um, um, and they also refinanced the project in 2016 to save up to something like 14 million, uh, well, between seven and 14 million a year. So that is the, the sort of, that's the basic structure. And we can always come back to that if, you know, if that's not clear. So um, just as, this is very basic, it just summarizes what the contract is about. And yes, it's about tree maintenance and replacement, but it's also about you know, roads, winter gritting, it's about bridge maintenance and repair and any new bridges. It's about all the verges and landscape area maintenance around all the highways. It's about um, street um, uh, traffic lights, street light maintenance, road drainage, street cleaning, and all the street furniture maintenance. So it's a, it's a, it's what is called a whole service contract. And in the same way as some of the private prisons that are being built in, in Britain are whole service contracts. In other words, the private sector fills the prison and they operate the prison. They keep the prisoners and they do the training or whatever goes on in prisons. The private sector do this. It's what's called whole service contract. And I, for one, have been really um, very concerned about the growth of those what is called whole service contracts because it's got massive longer term implications because you start saying well you know the NHS could be you know a whole service contract they've already started with uh, they failed in terms of one hospital in Hitching group where the private sector took over the management in, of, of, a, of a public hospital um, and that's been happening in, in other countries um, as well but so this, this is a whole service contract, and there are four like this in the country. There's Sheffield, Birmingham, Isle of Wight, um, and Hounslow have got the same kind of contract. So it, it, it's, uh, it's a fairly comprehensive, it's like saying everything to do with the roads 
everything to do with the verges, the traffic lights in, in Sheffield, you know, is Amy's job. And that puts them in a, in a very uh, powerful position, uh, apart from anything else. Um, and so I wanted, that's only just put up to sort of set the scope of it all, to, to remind people that it's, you know, and there's a big focus on trees, but it's not just about trees, it's about all of the roads and everything else surrounding those roads and pavements. And also, if you know anything, and I'm sure you all do, you know anything about highway maintenance and you know anything about tarmac, and you know anything about the way that private contractors treat roads and pavements, and they slap it down like, you know, gold dust, and it all falls apart and whatever. And so there's, you know, and that's what I, when people say to me anything about Amy and, and tarmac, I always, the red lights should be flashing, you know, immediately because you know what's going to happen in the longer term. And that's what exactly happened in Birmingham. Take a road full of bottles, just take the tarmac and whack it down, and hey ho, what happens? All the bottles reappear again, even deeper than they were. But that is the nature of what they are doing. I'll come back to that. Anyway. Um, so this is the scope of, uh, uh, that's the scope of the sort of contract. These, this is just some sort of key headings about um, uh, the nature of, of PPPs, PFI. Um, and it doesn't, it's only a, some of the key headings. You could, you could put another two or three slides up here and, and go on and on. Or we could talk about this all night. But I mean, I just want to highlight a few things. One is about incomplete contracts. From the public sector's point of view, there is no such thing as a complete contract. Academics and economists talk about you know, contracting as if it can be, that you can write the complete contract. But even if it was, if I had a contract um, uh, to come here tonight and, and no stumps, you know, sent me a contract and I signed it, I mean, that isn't a, a whole, a complete contract, because anything's going to happen. I nearly did, I nearly was late, you know, <laughs> right in there and all those other things, you know, <clears throat> that happens. Um, so there's no such thing as a, as, a, as a complete contract, complete myth. And it's even a bigger myth when you're saying this is a contract to do everything that moves on Sheffield's roads and the trees and all the roads and everything else for 25 years. How can you be, predict? How do you identify risk in year 24? You know, Amy is coming in doing a core investment. So what happens after the core investment? What happens to the other 21 years? You know, how do you predict that? I mean, it's incredibly difficult. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive risk in itself. The other thing is about PFI is that the, the big thing everybody says, there's a risk transfer between the local authority and the public sector to the contractor. The contractor takes on the risk. And that's more clear in when you're building a new building, like a new hospital or whatever. It's less clear when you're dealing with uh, roads and trees and, and traffic lights and, and all of that. But there is a degree of risk transfer. But the key point about all of that is that it's paid, the councils or public sector bodies pay a price for that. But the private sector says, yes, we'll take on some construction risk. Amy will be taking on a certain amount of risk in terms of uh, the work it's doing, but it's always paid, like, there's a price for that. They don't do it for nothing. So that is another aspect that always is a, is a thing that always racks up the price of PFI beyond what it would be uh, normally. These other headings are about complexity. Yes, they are complex, they're incredibly complex. And, um, you know, and when it comes to like documents and all this kind of thing, commercial confidentiality, and there are there's hundreds and hundreds of pages on the Sheffield contracts, just the legal aspects of it of, of a loan, um, and uh, and probably nobody. I mean, I've heard comments saying, "Well, Julie Daw didn't read the contract before she signed it." Well, no, of course she didn't, and it would be completely foolhardy for any politician to believe that they would sit down and read the whole bloody, probably a thousand pages, and not only read it, but understand it. 
and a lot of it is in complete jargon and legal legal uh, language. So there is an issue about complexity. There is about large volume of documents, commercial confidentiality during the, the, the procurement process because nobody wants to get any information out that the public might seize on and think, oh my God, you know? Um, they're going to do X, Y, and Z, and, and so on. Anyway, and it means less citizen participation, and it also means less than rigorous monitoring. Because going back to what I was talking about before, about the scales, one of the things that many local authorities, and I've seen them do it, um, in order to get the slides to drop down to give you on the one side, on the left-hand side, to give you value for money, is to reduce the cost of monitoring on the other side. And this scales tip over, and hey, presto, we've got a PFI. And that's at the expense of, of less than rigorous monitoring. The final, the key other thing that's important about all of these contracts, every, every PFI contract, Private finance is the average cost is between seven and eight percent, and you have to contrast that with the public cost, which is between three and four percent. So the interest, the cost of interest rates, when if the council was to say it was the contract was you know just for the sake of a billion pounds, um, so for every billion pounds, the council is paying basically on that. This is on average. Um, you know, three to four percent extra interest rates on that money because it's private money. It comes from private institutions, it comes from pension funds, and others. And that's nobody can borrow cheaper than the government. And all of this comes from the national. The NAO is the national audit office. They have looked at all of that. And the other key thing about this finance is that it is what they call off balance sheet. That means that it doesn't appear in the, the, in the public accounts. So therefore it's not public debt. And if you go on, if you look at the treasury um, spreadsheet, which has all 700 current projects, there are two columns. And one column is uh, where it talks about on balance sheet. And it's, it's a thing called the international financial, um, I have to read, Remember myself, international financial reporting standards on one side, and it says all on, on balance sheet. But the next one along says the ESA, which is the European uh, System of Accounts, and it all shows off balance sheet. So, in a sense, governments have a choice about you know, where it goes, whether well, it's on balance and it's a part of public debt, but it's not. And that is the that is the other big issue that, it, that it is getting it off the balance sheet. So therefore, it's not considered or classified as public debt. Right, this is the final one in this one. It's a point I want to make. This is from the uh, original uh, outline business case. What happens, the process of development of a PFI project is that. Um, uh, and as, as I say, this goes back, there was an earlier outline business case in 2006. Um, and goes, you develop an, uh, an outline business case that is tested uh, and whatever. And then eventually, you, it, uh, a final business case is developed. And, uh, you know, uh, and once you get to an agreed outline business, it then leads into the procurement process. But I don't really talk about all of that process, really. The point I want to make is that all the headings here are all about money and commercial interest. And my point really about all of this is there is no real evidence of comprehensive impact assessment that was carried out as far as I can see um, and the evidence from government council reports that you know it's the financial case, it's the project management case, it's the commercial case, economic case. But what the other case that, in my view, has to be there is a comprehensive impact assessment that says what, are, what is the economic impact? What is the social impact? What is the environmental impact? What is the health impact? 
what is the equality impact? And in fact, one sheet I saw, which was a checklist, and it had, it had um, uh, health equality impact. And underneath it, it said no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, you know, I think yeah, there's a flaw, one of the key flaws in this project was that is one of the evidence, there's evidence of that flaw running all the way from, from the very beginning. And so in a sense, some of the consequences that have happened would have been more fully understood in terms of like the environmental impact of what they've done to the trees and everything else should have been identified as part of that evidence and that whole, it, the whole process of impact assessment is to identify mitigation, so in other words, where you can mitigate against negative, negative um, um, processes, then you take action or you then build on and, and you build on the positive side. So we're ready. We're finished. Yeah. yeah. Can I suggest you move back one slide because there's an awful lot of meat on that slide before. Right. So, woman in the green, you had a question. I just wanted a question, a question on the next slide. Oh, sorry about which that. Which is about the comprehensive impact assessment. So is it just Sheffield that hasn't done that, or was that part of the template for doing PPI contracts? There's no, nothing in any of them to look at that. No, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, uh, not only Sheffield, but in my view, the vast majority of local companies didn't do it. And they could, did also, in some cases, they half did it. And a classic example was, yeah, I was in Pembe World, uh, um, a, a PFI street lighting contract in Newcastle, and we were. Um, I was working with the trade unions, and the council had price water house, and you know, it was all battle, battle, battle. But we were also working with some really good managers who didn't want a PFI, but were pushing, you know, basically pushing. Them. But anyway, uh, what they did was just do a half baked impact assessment. They said, well, if we're going to light up Newcastle, um, that would reduce accidents on the roads <laughs> and it would reduce crime and what they did was to use um, evidence of, of small scale um, um, crime reduction when you lit up an estate um, and you know that did reduce crime on that estate but the crime just went elsewhere all the way around it and they, they made the assumption that if you, if you did the whole city you know well, the theory was, in a way, it's all just going to go over the gate side, you know, so who gives a shit? Um, but, I mean, you know, but that was, that was one thought. And, and the other thought, that, that, that because they only did it half-baked, and then we exposed it all, most of the, 90% of the accidents were already on roads, which were already well lit. So the idea that you were lighting all these dark and all these other roads was going to reduce accidents was a myth. Anyway, that was, that's the way, so there were ex examples where that um, impact assessment was done, but it was already half baked. But it was never, I have never seen, um, I'm not saying that they don't exist, I'd really love to see it, but I have never seen a, a PFI um, project or a PPP strategic partnership, which we'll come on to a bit later, where there was a comprehensive impact assessment. Because they did it, because that would expose Lots of things. And that's why the lack of citizens' participation, we, we can't see even, maybe they did one paragraph, you know, on Sheffield, we never get to see what even what it was. Yeah. Right. So now, other questions now about yeah, the I mean, I mean, do, do you feel that Amy are a, a multinational company who probably done these contracts time and again with other organizations, do you feel like they kind of outmaneuvered Sheffield Council? And it's quite easy for us in retrospect to be quite clever about the impact. But maybe it wasn't that obvious at the time. Um, well, I, I, if they, well, I, what I would say is that to not just Sheffield, I'm not have, you know necessarily just having a go at Sheffield, but I would say, uh, and what we have said lots of many many times, that um, that if uh, you know the process of developing a, a PFI project. Uh, was done in a proper way, then a lot of the problems which have transpired would have been identified and, and, and people were stood about. And also, if they'd done that prior to uh, signing any contract, 
then where you, if you know you do an impact assessment and you know where there's going to be problems, you then draw up a contract to identify mitigating action. You say, well, we won't do it that way, we'll do it a different way. But, you know, it wasn't, it was, you know, all these contracts, there's a standard contract that has been produced um, by the government. And yes, it, there are different versions to it, slightly different versions, but it's basically a bog standard contract that every public sector body signs up to. So, you know, the problem goes back, you know, in the real, in the planning stage. And that's the same with PPP strategic partnerships, which are, in a, in a sense, they're like PFI, but they're really just service driven, you know, all about services. Usually, um, uh, IT, related services, all the core corporate services in the local authority, which are being outsourced. 67 contracts nationally. And if you, if you, and we, I've worked in about 20 local authorities, which have partly gone through that process, some have gone right through the process, some have gone right through the process, set up a contract, and gone back to the beginning again. But um, if you look at those projects as well, they were done in exactly the same way. There's no real impact assessment, no real economic analysis, and they've got an even worse track record. Okay, other sort of these are kind of foundational questions about the way the system overall works, what the weaknesses are. Yeah, Dimitri, and then you just. Yeah. I think it was on your first slide, <coughs> uh, Dexter. Um, you were talking about um, the contract being refinanced in 2016 mm -hmm. uh, to make a saving of between 7 and 14 million a year. Um, presumably, that's a saving for the council. Yes. Um, but does that take account of the fact that the repayment period has been extended to the year 2055? Yes, I mean, yeah, good point. Um, and uh, that was the extension of the contract. Well, it wasn't an extension of the contract, it was an extension of repayments. Yeah. A bit like the World Student Games, you know, you pay them for, you pay them for the World Student Games forevermore. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but... So the contract stays the same length, but the repayment was, was stretched, and in that, by stretching it and refinancing the, 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 the debt or the finance, um, the council was able to make a saving. And that's what's happened with lots of PFI projects. Um, not enough in many respects, but a lot of them have been refinanced because um, uh, projects have been refinanced once the construction work is finished, and you've got a bright new school or you've got a bright new um, uh, building, uh, uh, hospital, then you, you go to try and refinance it because most of the risk is in the construction. But once a hospital is built or a school is built, then a lot of the risk is reduced and therefore you can get lower interest rate, refinance it on lower interest rates. Um, I mean, I can't say very much more about the, the Streets Ahead project because I've searched and searched to look at the, the final detail. I've got various cabinet reports that talk about the lead into that decision to do that, but I can't find, maybe I haven't looked hard enough, um, I can't find the, the actual final document that said this is what we're doing and this is what, you know. But I, I know, you know, they have refinanced it and. Okay, uh, Justin. Well, mine was pretty much an overlap with what Dimitri was uh, asking. Um, so, you, you, as far as the research you've done, you can't categorically say that there is a bottom line saving in the refinancing period of 2040. Well, the, the, the council said it was, they looked at different options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and the, the final one I saw was say, they said that there was a I think between 0.4 and 0.6 of a million a year, uh, a year of saving, and that trans that turned into between seven and 14 million over the length of the contract. So it's not big money. But, but it's only a small portion of the yeah. entire deck anyway. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. And we're going to get on in part three, as you would know, and what are the kinds of options by terminalization, nationalization, cost advantages. So we're going to come back to this question. Is yeah. there any other questions here? 
Dimitri. It's, it, it's sort of more of a general question because you've spoken about this template contract, uh, which a lot of you know, local authorities have entered into. You've made it sound as if it's a very one-sided thing or you know, heavily balanced in favour of the, um, the contractor rather than in favour of the local authority, where normally two parties entering into a contract would, would only sign up to something that's, that's fair and balanced. My question is, um, what's in this standard template in the way of penalty clauses, break clauses and consequences for substandard work? Well, I mean, every contract covers those issues. You know, I mean, you could, you could say that, I'm not saying that, that the contract is all one-sided in terms of gaming or any other private sector, but um, uh, the problem is that once you let a contract, whether you're just outsourcing cleaning or just you know, outsourcing the whole of um, uh, highways and, you know, and everything else in, in Sheffield, um, uh, once you do that, um, on those standard basic standard contracts, they're supposed to be equally shared in terms of responsibility between the client and the contractor, but it puts a lot of power in the way into the private sector's hands, particularly if the client doesn't do their share of the bargain, which is to monitor the contract and um, uh, and to progressively monitor that contract. And I think um, that leads us right into what happened in Birmingham. Yeah. So that's your next thing. We've yeah, had we'll our minutes of questions, and we'll yeah. move on now to this little example of what Birmingham City Council has done compared <coughs> to what, in fact, has, has happened in our city. Yeah. First, I was just wanting to do a little bit about, so you understand, um, about who owns this contract. Right. So what we've got um, is uh, Amy Hallam, we've got two companies. We've got Amy Hallam uh, Highways Holdings, um, uh, sorry, or Amy Hallam Highways Limited, and then we've got a holding company above that. So about every BFI's got this. You've got a, the SPV, um, the basic company delivering everything, and on top of that, you've got a holding company. And they've got exactly the same shareholders. And in this case, we've got three shareholders. We've got Amy Ventures Asset Holdings, which is owned by Ferradio uh, of, of Spain. And um, we'll come back to that in a minute. We've got another, uh, another third is owned by Equitix uh, uh, Highways Limited. And that is owned by, because Equitix is a, a firm that uh, uh, rapidly uh, moved into PFI and uh, started acquiring, uh, started financing projects themselves, um, but also they were buying equity in other people's pro you know, projects around. They were buying up equity in hospitals and schools and so on and so on, and they grew very rapidly. And in 2015, they were taken over by Tetragon Financial Group, um, which is based in Jersey, registered in Jersey, although it's uh, re um, registered in Jersey, but it, it, it's got it's listed on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. The third, so they got a third, then he's got a third, they got a third, and then uh, Iberia was the, the original in, in investor, and that was was owned by Scottish um, Bank of Scotland, then Lloyds took over Bank of Scotland, so it was, Bank of, it was Lloyds when Sheffield set this project up, but you know, if things have changed hands a bit. Um, uh, Uberia Investments was sold to Aberdeen a um, Asset Management. Aberdeen Asset Management was then merged with Standard Life in 2017. And then the company was sold to Pensions Infrastructure Platform in December 2017. Uh, this, jump, this jumped in based on Dexter's research. I did a big dossier on that, which is down on that table. Got all these companies all listed there. If you want to pick one up, you have to copy it. So it was all the extra work. But. Right, so pensions infrastructure uh, platform um, is basically uh, was set up uh, 
by uh, various pension funds and was encouraged by the government to increase pension fund investment in private infrastructure. And uh, so there is uh, uh, pension funds have invested uh, in this um, and it, it, it's uh, operated by an organization, a fund called Downwell Capital, um, and it's been, you know, it's been growing. And so, you know, we're now increasingly, I mean, this has been going on for some time, but our, pun, our public sector pension funds are increasingly invested in PFI schemes. And it's not just public sector pension funds, it's private private funds as well. So, um, uh, uh, so that's, that's basically what Amy Helm Holdings, the company, is about. But it doesn't end there. It gets even more complicated. <laughs> <coughs> what this shows is there's your two Amy Highways, the SBB and the holding company of the SBB. And then we've got, you see, Equitix comes in, this is the, the one with 33%, and then you've got um, Equitix Highways is owned by Equitix Capital Eurobond Limited. It's a, another subsidiary of Equitix. And then that in turn is owned by uh, uh, company uh, fund Holdco. You see, Holdco is just a holding company, just a, a name for it. Um, um, that's based in Jersey. And then you've got Equitix Fund, LP. A, a, a fund, when you see fund, NLP is a limited partnership. Or you see LLP, uh, which is limited liability partnership. Um, and this is an investment fund which has been invested through these organizations into the AME project. But when then you have to then start looking at well, who funds, who owns Equitix Fund? And that's got two things got it. Another company, which is also based in Jersey, is a general partner, and it's got another company which is based in the UK. So this Jersey goes out to Jersey, this other comes out to the UK, and this is where the pension funds also come in. And if you got, you can go through and identify, you know, they can be identified. Then, so these two companies are basically owned by Equitix Holdings Limited. It's a holding company. And then, these are all UK. Then it then transpires, Equitix's name disappears and it comes into Pace Bidco. <laughs> the name is great. Right? <laughs> um, that's a subsidy. And then it, you follow it a bit. Who, so who, who owns Pace Bidco? Well, Pace Top Co Limited. And I was like, fucking oh, Top Shop. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't swear. Um, so that's a holding company. And then the question is, well, who owns that? Well, you have to go to the Cayman Islands. <laughs> and then you come back to Tetragon, financial group, who owns? So you, go, you follow the circle. So it's complicated, but that's, you know, in a sense, it's not straightforward when you just see, well, third, three firms are on a third. Well, it's more complicated than that, particularly where you've got firms like Equitex, where they set this up. And I recently did, it was, uh, it was commissioned by The Guardian to, to do an analysis of um, Equitex projects in Scotland. And I came up with all of these kind of, these kind of tables for PFI projects in Scotland, um, with some of which are, are like this, virtually mirrored this, and others are linked back to the Middle East and so on. I mean, you know. It's, it's finance is it's very diversified. Um, so, so just to generalise a bit, um, I've been doing a lot of uh, analysis where and, and building a database of where the sale of equity in PFI projects. So, in a sense, there's been different ownership in in Sheffield. But none of the three bidders, none of the three equity holders have actually sold the equity. But that is potentially likely to happen 
after the, finish, the, fin or the completion of the core um, uh, investment. Um, just like, you know, it's equivalent to a pay by project being, not the hospital project being complete and the risk being reduced. Um, so, but anyway, my point is that the annual rate of return where the equity in projects like this one have been sold is 28.7%. That's based on a fairly significant sample. But what is normally expected when business, final business cases are made around PFI projects, the private sector expects a return between 12 and 15 percent. So what we're, what's happening is they're getting twice that amount of money in terms of a rate of return on, on these kind of PFI projects. So we have to bear that in mind. The other thing is that there are, I mean, it's just points to you know, the scale of this offshore secondary market. It's not just what's happening in Sheffield, it's, um, it's you know, elsewhere. Um, and the scale of that is, is really very significant. And also, I have to point out, normally not very nice, but there are nine PFI projects in Sheffield, and 47% of the projects is owned in offshore tax havens. So it's nine projects, it's, uh, it's the schools projects, it's the Northern General Hospital project, it's the heart of the city offices, but it's mainly, mainly schools, and you know, it, this has already happened in, in Sheffield. And it includes you know, Equitex, Bones, two, two other projects um, as well. So, um, well, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm just talking very briefly about the, the, the Birmingham co co contract. And um, the point was made before that, that um, in a sense, we can contrast what's happened in Sheffield and contrast what's happened in, in Birmingham. And uh, the contracts aren't exactly the same. Obviously, and uh, you know the, the, uh, the attack on the trees in Sheffield wasn't mirrored uh, in, in, the, in the same kind of way in Birmingham. Uh, but Birmingham was very much more focused on, on the roads, etc. And I haven't really looked in detail to compare those two contracts anyway. But I don't know if anybody has. But um, they're not, you know, there are differences. But what the council has done is is um, and it was, you know, it was fairly, it, it was blatant in a way. I mean, of course, there was like I joked before about you know potholes, and then they you know, whack down the tarmac, and then you know the potholes reappear again. Um, and, and you know there were some uh, um, really good photographs in the local press. And in a sense, what happened in, in in Birmingham is that the council really took them to task, and there was a, a, a massive dispute. It went to adjudication where you try and or solve through adjudicators, you try and resolve matters before you go to court. That didn't work, so it went to court um, in one place, one court, I think the, um, the council won, then the Amy won, and then the council won in, in the end. And um, for review, um, allocate, in its financial accounts for 2017, allocated 208 million losses on that Birmingham contract. Because of partly to do with, the, with the, or largely to do with the, the penalties and uh, uh, the consequences of that. The other interesting thing is that because of that, um, uh, uh, services take sixty percent of Ferrovia's um, <coughs> revenue accounts. Accounts for sixty percent, but Ferrovia has only just announced. A week ago, that they've engaged the contract consultant. They're exploring the potential disinvestment of all or part of the assets of the services division. And who sits in the services division? It's Amy. So Amy is potentially could be sold on to somebody else. That's what they're doing. 
And from Ferrovio's point of view, suffering that two, 208 million losses last year um, has, you know, has had you know, major implications. Um, and if you contrast where their services, yes, it represents 60% of their revenue, but it's that of, of their annual revenue. But that's the one that's giving them the headache. And they have toll roads, but toll roads are really good for, for the cash machines. Everybody's driving up, chucking money into the thing, or, or sapping through on high tech things, and it's all just coming out of your account. It's fantastic, you know, it's a fantastic way. Scamming money out, out of people, you know, to have a toll road. And they don't have to do very much, you just have a few things across the road, and it's there. So, from their point of view, and they all, they've got a stake in Heathrow Airport. And they don't have to do very much. They just operate these things. And this is the one that's giving them a headache. Partly to do with this. And this is what they're now considering, considering. The problem we've got, and I've looked through the contract. The contract says, well, it doesn't matter if this changes hand because Clause, whatever it is, leave it, leave it with you. There's a clause in the contract that says it doesn't matter if the company changes hand, um, you know, we'll just continue the contract. But, but, and it's a massive but, the opportunity is if they are going to sell it, then that has got ramifications and all kinds of opportunities to exploit in terms of. Finding out who the, the, the bidders are, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. There's all kinds of things to explore. We can explore things. Well, you can explore things. Well, I'm saying, right. um, around that whole issue. In other words, never let a crisis go to waste the crisis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, so, I'll stop there. So, we've now sort of, this is Birmingham. Uh, questions? I believe Amy are taking Birmingham back to the Supreme Court now. Right. I read that last week. Oh, right. Well, I didn't see that. Why don't you just give a little background of what happened in the court case before the Supreme Court? Um, yeah, I looked up a few Ruben's things. Ruben's done a lot of research on this field. <clears throat> it, it went through about three different courts. That's right. Things, and eventually, the Court of Appeal found in favor of Birmingham City Council, and they ruled against Amy's ingenious new interpretation of the 25-year contract. And uh, they were, Amy were ordered to pay <coughs> almost 45 million within three months. And that's why they've gone back now to the Supreme Court to try and get a favor for them. Yeah, right. mm. yeah. There's a famous quote from Dexter, which was that in, in Birmingham, they tried to put the screws into Amy. In Sheffield, we in fact fallen in love with Amy. Yeah. Okay, so Val? Yeah, I wanted to know what's different about Birmingham City Council that they, uh, who was it within there who was keeping more of a hawk eye on Amy? And how did it come to such a sharp criticism? Yeah, well, I think it was, um, the way I would put it is, was, um, what happened to Birmingham streets is the equivalent of what happened to your trees, except in Birmingham it was streets. And, and there was lots of photographs in all the, the, the Birmingham papers showing how the work had only just been done in a matter of weeks, and you know roads were in, in a really bad state. And that became the big issue. It wasn't a tree issue, it was a road issue. And you know, like I said before, about how you, you know, you, you know, in a sense, anybody can slap down the tarmac. And if, but if you don't actually, you know, <coughs> rebuild the foundation of roads, or you don't, and you don't do, if you don't do it all properly, then things come back to haunt you. And that's what happened in Birmingham. And you know, politically, that forced the council to to take action. I was just wondering if we could find ways of attacking Amy on their roads standards they've done in Sheffield and take their attention off the trees that way. Well, I, you know, I would say 
I mean, I've seen some photographs of uh, in the star um, of you know uh, where there's been they've done the road and they've been doing pavement, pavement, pavements, and there's been you know trees. The curbs are at a different angle, and they've just slapped down tarmac. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, there's, there are. They'll say, oh no, it was different, you know, we did it all, and it was just one, it was one bad example. But, you know, where that happens, historically, in any city, you know, and I live, there was a firm called Murphy's in London, they did, you know, it was based in um, Camden, in, in Kensal Town, and, uh, uh, Kentish Town, I mean, and uh, that's what they did. You know, they were tarmac slappers, and they got, Money from all local authorities in London, and there was a problem. He just got the tarmac, and you, you know, you put it down, and it, it looks all right for you know two weeks, three weeks, maybe a year, but it, you know, it comes it comes back to haunt you. Okay, uh, Russell. Does uh, Parobial's accounts reveal anything about the profitability or otherwise of their Amy Howland Highways <coughs> operation? Um, no, I, I mean, I've only looked at them um, sort of, uh, generally. Excuse uh, me, just one, there's a couple of chairs, there's a chair here. It's so crowded down by the door there. There's, there's some over here. There's yeah. another chair over here. I got suggestions that it's only to get a 60 second stretching break and then get to the, get, get in more comfortable chairs and then we'll get back to the question. For Russell's question is about Roby and Amy and. Yeah, is it, I mean, it's probably shrouded in secrecy, I guess, but do their accounting requirements mean that they must reveal anything about this part of their operation? Um, well, you can look at a Amy's accounts themselves. I mean, and Amy's got two holding companies, I mean, apart from the, you know, the ones we talked about. Um, but both them sit um, Amy PLC, and then above that is Amy UK PLC. Mm -hmm. So you can look at, you know, I mean, that's a job that could be done, if it hasn't already been done, is to look at that holding company, Amy UK PLC, and that will, you know, that shows the, and it'll have a description of what's happened in that whole play process, and also what, you know, the right of the have to make. So you can, you can find uh, certain things, but you've got to fall through that latest account. Okay, is it, uh, Justin? Just um, sort of picking up on what Russell asked, um, it, it's very easy to say, uh, talk about Amy, but um, there'll be profit made from um, the Amy PLC's involvement in the GFI contract as a whole, for the special for the um, But then there'll be another stream of revenue from the um, uh, Amy LG, which will who have main service providers. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's it's kind of a complicated... Yeah. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it's, no, it it's is not just a straightforward, yeah. Amy is making profit from this. There are oh, you, there are different um, streams of revenue and two different companies. Yes, and, you can, and some of that you can trace, and others you get only so far, you can't fully trace it. And it's like that chart I had up about all the different companies. Um, in, in, in terms of equity, you can you can uh, you can there are company accounts for all of them except the ones in Jersey and, and in the Cayman Islands. Um, but um, and you can check you can identify certain things. But when it comes to actually determining uh, precisely what they're making out of any particular contract, that becomes much more difficult. You can go to the SPVs. The SPV tells you more, probably, about what's happening because that shows you the level of dividends that have been paid annually, and that that is a good signal about you know how profitable they are. Can I ask you a related question? We all know that the contract in Sheffield started in 2012, yeah. and then there's what's called this core investment period, which they're supposed to have done so much by they would see like 2017. But I believe, in fact, it's really not finished the core investment period in Sheffield. And right now we're in 
a pause period, our colleagues are having negotiations, etc. What's the importance in terms of financially of the sort of generally at least the first five year period versus in this case the next twenty five, but twenty. What so what happens in that five years compared to what happens down the road? Well, I mean I and mean, that doesn't really but go back to that the original diagram where, where the council is repaying the SPV for the, the money that there's, they've raised in their, their spending. Um, but that is based on an agreement that, which doesn't re really reflect. That is, is spread out over the 26 years and it increases on, a, you can see from the, the uh, Treasury uh, spreadsheet, you can see how, how that increases over years and years. That doesn't reflect the amount of money that's been invested initially on whether you build a new hospital or a new school or in this case, that core investment period, where there's been much more um, uh, investment put in compared to the rest of the whole period. But to me, that, that therein lies the problem. Not only is it about the quality of the work that's done in that core period, but also what is going to happen if that, if that isn't really good. It's like if. You, Let's take a hospital. Uh, um, you, you take a school. You take the Edinburgh schools that you know I did some work on, where the wall fell down and they closed seventeen schools, um, and then they found that uh, the outer wall wasn't connected to the inner wall through wall ties. Basic uh, architectural flaw. And ironically, in Ireland, they closed a school yesterday that closed another thirty schools for the same problem goes on. And um I forgot the point I was gonna make now. Um core investment. Yeah core investment. So it that's um that there's a lot of activity and also if you looked at Amy's accounts there'd probably be a, a more um, expenditure on subcontractors in that period um as well you know in that core investment period. But the problem is is what happens Unless that work is done really well, um, you know, what, and what's happened in Edinburgh uh, schools, what's happened in a, in a hospital in uh, um, Tyne and uh, um, in, uh, Teesside, the work wasn't done uh, properly, and there's major building faults, and that contract has just recently been terminated, um, and it went to the High Court. The High Court said, no, you can terminate the contract, and you know, there'll be a lot of losses for the investors and so, so on and all of that. So if you don't get the core um, investment done properly, then that's got consequences for the rest of the other 21 years. Yeah. And because it is so, such of a core, it's like, the, it's like a blitzkrieg, you know? It is in terms of the trades, that's what they've done. And they've, you know, oh, oh, doing as many of the roads, they've done oh, all the street lights, is from what I understand. So they're doing all of that. But then, you know, so what's Amy going to do? You know, just sort of set so, that, you know. So for that core investment yeah. period, is, is it also sort of putting all the money into the plant that's needed for the next 25 years? You know, like the bulldozers and what have you, you know. Well, it, it's, it's doing that, but it, it, what it's trying to do is to, is to uh, uh, um, have a rapid improvement in Sheffield streets. And, you know, car notes, you know, uh, you know, I live here, 16, 18 years, and he cursed the roads all the, you know, every day because they were really terrible compared to other. And they have improved. Yeah. I understand and that Amy owns almost nothing. Everything's leased or the plant is right. leased. Right. That, that would be half of the Not forgetting that the majority of the use of some work is done by subcontractors anyway. One of them pulled out and left a hundred miles away in the core investment period. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that core investment period is absolutely crucial. And you know, given, yes, it's been delayed because of the, 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 whole, the whole trade campaign and things. Um, I don't think it has actually. No. no. Is it not? No. I think that's a bit of a council's thing. Sorry, sorry. All right. Sorry. All right. <laughs> uh, but you know, what I'm saying is that is absolutely fundamental. And, and that comes back to the whole issue about the monitoring, which we'll talk about a bit later. But unless all of that is 
monitor to make sure it's done properly. And I don't want to keep, you know, keep saying this all about, you know, tarmac and all this kind of, you know, bad workmanship. It, you know, it comes back, it reappears. And the real danger, if that core investment isn't done properly, you know, year 10, never mind year 26, year 10, 12, there'll be all kinds of problems reappearing. But surely they know that, and isn't that an incentive for them to mutually withdraw at some point over the next 20 years? Along with SCC, who suffered reputational damage. Well, they, they could sell the equity, and the third equity they've got in, in the Allen Holdings, and they'll go off. Well, I'd like to suggest we we're going up like an hour and ten minutes here, and we haven't come to now. What are the options? Bio termination, nationalization, and cost advantages, disadvantages. I think it's quite important. I think uh, we don't all grasp of every aspect of PFIs, but either does Dexter. So, uh, but what, what in fact now are the uh, possible options? What are that we that are potentially to get rid of? To get Amy out, right? Okay. Just, I mean, I just want to highlight the, the infographic, which I think is fantastic. So um, that's done by Isabel, by the way, yeah. down in the corner. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> well done. Right. So that's just you know where Amy has got the Edinburgh contract, trees, Birmingham, and so on. And uh, right. So yeah, just uh, hold it just for a second, so people can just see it. All the things that have happened around the country with Amy's. You know, hands on every one of them. Well, yeah. What, what was in London? The transport for London. What was that? Well, transport for London has three big, massive contracts, and that particular one is called Tube Lines. It, uh, uh, they were responsible for uh, improving um, uh, three major lines, um, and that contract was 5.5 billion. So if you think the Sheffield contract's big, and in, in, on top of that, there were two other contracts. One was six billion and the other was five billion. They also went pear shape and were terminated in London. So, you know, the message in that is, doesn't matter how big it is, it can be terminated. Right. They in Liverpool felt the death of a worker under Amy. Right. It turned into MLG, but it was um, in infrastructure. Right. They changed the, co the company name. So right. there's, a, there's a fatality there. Right. 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 Put a little cross there, right? Okay, so okay. what are the options? What, 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 are, we, well, what are the okay, possibilities? Okay. Well, well no, just, just as a context for, for this, when we talk about before we talk about op uh, options, um, the, top the top table is you know, what's happened to contracts? The 700, well, there were 800 contracts, basically, now there's 700, um, but what's happened in the meantime? Well, I did a report um, with uh, buyouts, bailouts, determinations, and the figures were lower. What's happened just in the last few months, there's been um, uh, a buyout, there's been six more terminations, and there are 45 uh, contracts where they've experienced ma major problems. And uh, that's just to, 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 in a sense, show uh, what's already happened. And this, this, this is the capital cost of those projects. So total is about tw you know, 25, uh, nearly 26 billion pounds. So that's just a context. When I talked before about strategic partnership funds, which are much more like service contracts, which in a sense, what the Amy one is, is largely about, um, there's been 67 contracts. These are th these are percentages of, of that. So basically, in terms of the ones that have um, failed, there's been 15 uh, terminated. There's been four um, uh, reduced in school, and there's been there's two that have um, uh, uh, had problems. So if you just compare, if you look at that, 22.4, six, nearly 30 percent of those contracts. Um, have either been reduced in scope or more fundamentally terminated those contracts. And that track record is even higher than you know, the rates of, of, of up here. My point is that um, it doesn't matter what size the contract is or sensibly how complicated it is, 
what this table highlights, or it hides in the sense, um, is a whole range of different size of contracts, different um, uh, financial value, and different levels of complexity. Uh, it's just there to give heart that these things have happened. What we need to look at now is the conditions by which these things came about. So, could I ask you about reduced in scope? Sorry? Is, reduced in scope, does that mean that the, the buyer of the services and Amy agreed to reduce the size of the contract and the details in it? Well, um, what normally happened, well, what's happened in lots of cases, like in Somerset, County Council had a big contract with IBM um, and uh, the council were getting fed up uh, with uh, poor performance in certain services. Mm -hmm. And so what the council did was, was basically go to IBM said, and just you know, said, well, we're going to bring these back in-house. So the, they, they amended the contract, brought the staff back in-house and delivered the services directly. And that's, you know, that, that's happened in lots of, sorry, just go back. Um, in lots of these contracts, what happened in these contracts, the, a lot of these, the 15 word immediate uh, terminations, there was quite a few of these also were reduced in scope first, right. and then there were terminations where the contract had still continued to fail. So it would be possible to have an agreement or renegotiate to say, take the trees out of what's happening in Sheffield and put the trees back in house? Well, it's more difficult than that. Right. I'll come on to that in a minute. I, I, I mean, uh, theoretically, you know, that should be the case, but it's, it's more complicated. I'll come, I'll come on to that. Then. So what we've got, basically, um, is there are three, well, there's four of here, but I mean, there's really three major, major options. I mean, just going back on, on what you, the question you were, yeah. the point you were making um, was, yes, there is, um, within the contract, there are uh, what they call, every contract has got a change mechanism, whereby uh, that can be initiated by the, the, the council, and it can be initiated, uh, in some cases, by, by the contractor. Um, and there's a, a, a procedure going through and in the Sheffield contract, there are three different levels of, uh, of changes that they categorize as small amount of change. I can't, I can't remember the exact name, but there's a high level of change and medium level of, of change. The high level of change, the assumption is that the council would retender some of that work uh, rather than necessary to bring it back in house. But so in all of that, it gets complicated, but yes, to go back to your point, there is some um, room uh, for negotiation and, and change. But that's how much that is, is, must, is very difficult to say. And you know you wouldn't be able to say, well, let's just tip the, tip the bloody trees out. You know, that would be, they would see that as a fundamental change in the contract. Are these changes, um, are there fines associated with changes? I've heard that somewhere. Fines? Yes. Um, well, no, there's, um, uh, there are financial deductions um, in all contracts. But um, and there are t the terms and conditions of those uh, um, uh, this, um, uh, fines, uh, you know, they don't, um, PFI and contract, they don't call them fines because that sounds a bit, you know, Negative. a bit harsh. Lots <laughs> uh, uh, um, of money got, to the cut to, for example, to Sheffield City Council. Yeah, I mean, if it comes back to monitoring. I mean, Stuart's going to talk about that in a minute. So, um, uh, it, if you do, the, if you've got a good monitoring system, you identify, uh, and the contract is written in a way that allows you to, to do that problem monitoring two things together and so that if um, if a road I mean if a build if a school is uh, if a classroom is unavailable then in a the school then for how many hours or days that classroom is unavailable 
because the contractor has not done something and that customer one is closed, they get a financial deduction for that. And the art of, of deductions is that they have to be substantive enough to hurt the contractor. And if they're not substantive enough, then, and if it's cheaper for the contractor to take the brunt of the fine, then employ the staff to do the work properly, which is what happens in cleaning contracts everywhere, then uh, you, you, there's, no, there's, no, there's no pressure on the contract to, to deliver. But that's the art of, of, of you know, developing a monitoring system to, you know, to do that. So that you impose those deductions. I mean, that's what Birmingham did. You know, they said, right, you've screwed up these roads, this is what you've done, this is what it means. But Sheffield contract is self-monitoring, whatever that means. Well, yeah, well, that, yes, I mean, uh, thank you for saying, uh, using that term, because there is um, a degree of self-monitoring that goes on. And that you, you could argue that every contractor should self-monitor a contract. Because they need to know, they need to gain the in, you know, intellectual knowledge about how the, their own contract is, is performing, how their own staff are performing, and all those things. But that doesn't replace the role of the local authority as the client in terms of monitoring the contract. But that, that's the reason they do them when we ask about that. that. The council explained that it's actually Amy's job to monitor the work and not the council's job. The ca the <laughs> well, council that's the problem, but that's where we are. Yeah. But the, the client team has been drastically <coughs> reduced. I think there's like five vacancies that they haven't bothered to refill on the <coughs> monitoring team. So we know that the council isn't, or clearly isn't effectively monitoring the contract. Well, if that's, if that's the case, then that, you know, that is a major thing to, to really develop a strategy yeah. around. They're also, mis they're also misreporting that they have actually done so. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, like that, the yeah. that. I mean, I've always argued, and you know, we did work, we did work with um, the uh, local government association way back in the days of competitive, compulsory competitive tendering in local, local government. This is going back in the early, late 1980s and 90, early 1990s. And, um, and we said it at the time, and we proved it at the time, that uh, contract monitoring in local government was crap. Yeah. You know? And it wasn't just us saying that, but you could prove that it's crap. And a lot of that hasn't really changed, in my view. And that is the problem. And if you look at the ways in which one of the things we did, in doing that, that research and that work, was that he started looking about who was appointed to the monitoring officers. And, and in, in the old CCT days, sorry, I'm deviating from the thing, but in the old CCT days, that when certain staff, there was staff retained on the client, and there was staff that went to the contractor. And often there were people in the middle who weren't employed anywhere, and, and were sort of lost a bit. So, what happened was they ended up as the con monitoring staff. Well, they were never really equipped to be contract monitors. They were never really skilled up to do it. And they, you know, if you will be a contract monitor, if you're going to be monitoring a contract, you've got to have confidence. You've got to have in wits about you in terms of what the, what the contract says, and the, you know, and to throw your weight around. If that isn't done. That it's pointless. The Sheffield seems to be at the moment. I mean, Amy have not surfaced the number of roads they said they would in the core investment period. Right. So the council have said, oh, okay, you can forget that road and forget that. And we'll knock it off the, uh, the yeah. number of roads you need to do. So you, meet, you hit your target. It's just a <laughs> It is. Oh, sorry, can I just run through these? Yeah. Um, time. Um, so there is potential for that. Um, Small changes. Small changes. Schedule 18 and the other bit. So there is contract termination. That's the other option. Either voluntary by the contractor, and that's what's happening where contracts have gone pear shaped, um, particularly around waste waste management contracts, um, Manchester, Dumfries, and a of other places where the contract is a technology failure and the contractors have been losing money. 
So in a, in a way, the, con the contractors have been saying, look, get the hell out of here, you know? Um, so there's that, and well, there's been a lot of more contracts enforced by the local authorities because of poor performance or and also a vested interest in achieving financial savings. But contract termination um, is, uh, uh, is not done on a whim because just like the fight that Amy are putting up in, in Birmingham, um, uh, you know, a contractor, um, unless it's voluntary contract, and the contractor is losing money. And you can say that strategically, you can force a situation in Sheffield, like in Birmingham, where the contractor is losing substantially, then that is a driver to pushing Amy into a position of, all right, I'm off. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's hard. And, you know, uh, when you look through, there's that report I, you know, I did, and it, it, I've only got the end of it, the, the appendices. When you look through how those contracts were terminated, what were the conditions that led to those contracts um, being terminated? They were all basically very substantial. It isn't just saying the council did, check the council, it's not going to just turn around and say, okay, tree campaigns, we've heard what you said, we don't like Amy either, so we're going to get rid of you. You know, it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. And it takes a lot of work to get to the position where the council will say and support and will get really um, alienated and um, accept the fact that there is poor performance on a large scale. That might take, won't happen tomorrow, it might take another five years, it might take 10 years, or whatever. Um, and they take long, even the strategic performance contracts. We, we said, we did, we, we paused for lots of trade union branches around the country. We said to the council, this is, this is madness. Don't do it. And you point out the financial thing, point out the, oh no, we're going to do it. You know, and they did it. And, you know, in a sense, we proved them wrong. But by then, you know, IBM had had, you know, nine years of a contract and so on and so on. They don't, they don't wake up fast enough to what is actually happening. So that is, that is difficult. The third option is a contract buyout. The problem with a contract buyout is that it becomes, it's negotiated and both sides employ consultants. But at the end of the day, a buyout means that uh, in this in the Sheffield case, it would mean that Amy would get all the money between now and what is due to it over the contract. So the contract gets all this money, the contractor, the SPV, gets all this money but they, get it in, they don't get it over another 21 years, they get it in a lump sum now. So it looks smaller, but they get it. And yes, like the Hexham Hospital, which is one of the uh, early uh, buyouts in the Thumbland, the Thumbland County Council loaned 105 million, raised 105 million quid, gave it to the trust and said, right, that's great, use that money to buy them out. And yes, the hospital saved, I think, three million per year. And on some of the other buyouts, there were savings made, but it wasn't big money. Because some people would say, what, three, three million quid? Well, you know, it's a lot. But, you know, in, in the scale of things, it's not. But the key thing is, the private sector gets paid all of the money that they're expected over the length of the contract. And by the time you take the consultant fees, and there's a thing called interest rate swaps, which are most, not all PFI contracts have, but a lot of PFI contracts have, which are, you take out like an insurance against interest rates increasing or falling um, over the length of the contract. And some of those, you know, if you terminate the contract, those interest rate swaps are gonna be renegotiated, and that is more money. 
and the hospital, the head from the hospital one, they pay 27 million quid to get out of those interest rate swaps. So it's it's it sounds like a you know to buy them out, but and there might be some might be some gains, but uh, it's uh, financially it's not uh, a magic wand. And the council skin anyway. So. The works at least, yeah. Why don't you do number four now? Nationalisation. Nationalisation, right. Um, well, um, <clears throat> uh, um, I've written a paper with Helen Mercer about how nationalisation should, uh, uh, but that, in the longer term, that is, we would argue, that is the best option and the cheapest option. And that what now, this form of nationalisation we do would buy, buy, we nationalise every one of the, the 700 um, project companies that exist. You know, like the Amy Allen Holdings, Holdings and all the other SPVs around the country. They would be <coughs> renationalised. And they would be renationalised at book value. In other words, you wouldn't, they wouldn't be paid the market value, be paid book value current book value and um, financial analysis uh, uh, showed that uh, we took a sample of 100 projects which were a wide selection by geography, type of contract, length of contract and so on and um, uh, were fell out to be uh, a, a cost about 2 to 3, 2.3 to 2.5 billion pounds which in terms of a nationalisation of 700 hospitals, schools, all of them, you know, et cetera, et cetera, is small beer in a way. But there would also be annual savings of, a, of at least 1.4 billion by eliminating the SBV profits because those would be state <coughs> controlled and there would be reduced uh, profits and administration costs. And the service contracts, the services that for cleaning and maintenance and all of those services, which, for, which are part of all PFI projects, they would be transferred back to local authorities or to their gestures. Would it be a good time to now look at, the, have some discussion on the options? Yeah. Is that, so there, there is four options here. Number four uh, is sort of outside the capacity of Sheffield City yeah. Council. Can, can I just actually, ask if, if, if the Labour Party are committed to doing that or, or are they yeah. interested in doing that? Or? Yes, they are. Yeah. I mean, we did that. Um, that paper was, a, that was presented as an academic paper um, um, for a set of reasons. Um, but that was done uh, uh, directly uh, under the, uh, the uh, influence of John McDonnell. John McDonnell was totally committed to that. Um, and we worked very closely with John McDonnell's economic advisor in the process of all of that. So that was done. And also, you know, spent a lot of time in the lead up to the uh, last year's Labour Party conference. Uh, where the whole nationalisation of PFI was announced. That didn't happen out of fresh air, that was a lot of discussion that went on. So it's not inconceivable anyway? No, it's... Yeah. it's, it's, it's but obviously what we have just to do... Just need the government, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Is, that, is our campaign here, uh, you know, what can we, what are, what are the possible options that we could, what are the, you know, pros and cons of some of these things, some questions people might have about? Well, the contract termination for poor performance sounds like the best one to go for in Sheffield because the contract buyout sounds uh, very tricky with a lot of legal fights and things and you can end up losing quite badly. So that would mean actually doing some research on how badly this contract is being performed. And that is being carried out by the People's Audit. Right. And uh, have you got any facts and figures? Not yet. Right. But it's oh, ongoing. So this, this is some, some work done on the poor quality, essentially the work on roads and sewers and all that kind of stuff. Some stuff. Insofar as lay people are able to identify mm. Mm. Right. and call them out on it. Mm. Yeah. Okay, uh, David, then uh, Alison first and then David. Well, just to comment that contract termination is not going to happen because the council are dead set on retaining England. 
they, they've got no interest at all in, in trying to go for, to, to hit them for all the problems that have been occurring because they're fully behind them and supportive of them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure that's, I'm sure I'm on, I'm on a basis for challenging you, and I'm sure you're right. But what I would say was that, um, you know, uh, things change quite rapidly. I've heard, you know, in some of the Somerset example, it wasn't, it was very near a PFI, it wasn't technically a PFI, um, and the chief executive sense said, you know, this is fantastic, it's, this is beyond excellent, you know? And they were totally committed to it. And IBM is a global company. You know, we're not, not taking them about some rinky-dink IT company or whatever, it was IBM. And IBM came in and they promised the world, promised a, you know, virtual university, a new, you know, all kinds of new buildings and everything else. Never delivered any of all of those things. And eventually, at the end of the day, Council said, you know, on your bike. And that's happened in lots of contracts. They start out just, you know, and I, you know, I was probably being a bit wicked saying it was a love affair between the council and Amy, although you might think that it is, no, uh, you know, but I mean, um, I was being provocative, but um, uh, that, I would put money, I would put, I'm not a betting person, but I put money on that, that isn't going to last very long. And I, because I think, in a sense, if, and if they're so dependent on each other, to such, that's such a scale, that that is, that's a recipe for failure in the long term. Because all the, if you look at all the contracts where authorities have been so committed to it all, um, you know, they, they often don't end up like that. David, just one second. Uh, David. Yeah, just uh, going back to the contract buyouts. In the, the case of uh, Sh uh, Sheffield, what would that look like? Would would, it, would they get the two point two billion pounds, and we wouldn't get our roads fixed, or would it be less money? Surely the, the it wouldn't it wouldn't be they get two point two billion and we get nothing. <laughs> you mean the work no. they haven't done? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well. The, 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 um, they would get, uh, um, they've already been paid five years or whatever, pay, yeah. or six years of payments. Whatever was left, um, uh, but they wouldn't get 2.2 billion, they'd get what was left, but they wouldn't get, they would get the current 2018 value of what is due to them. So it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's not all of that money, it's what, what, the 2.2 is worth in today's money, not over the next 25 years. But, but 19 would, more years. 19 more years. But would yeah. there be any discount for work that hasn't been done? Well, well, well that, that would that would be part of that. There was, you know, like, uh, you know, roads were taken out, and you know, don't do, you know, you don't have to do that, you know, etc. Then that that would be part of that agenda. But you know, what I'm saying is that. In terms, when you look at that they that they will get um, uh, uh, Amy or the, the, the shareholders of the company, the three shareholders um, would get uh, you know they would be no, negotiating a lump sum relative to what they would get for today's prices and and for work they've already done. They would also be. Um, <coughs> If the interest rate swaps, and I don't know whether there are interest rate swaps in this contract or not, but if there are interest rate swaps, they would have to be, and they would be, have to be renegotiated uh, or terminated um, with the financial institution where, where those interest rates swaps have gone. So, and as I say, if you look at the contracts that have, 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 um, which have been terminated, um, you know, there was a, you know, the Sky Bridge was a famous one. The Sky Bridge was built, um, the Scottish government, uh, it was a, there was a, uh, beforehand there was a ferry across to the mainland. Um, they built the bridge, they cut the ferry, and there was tolls on the bridge. And the people on Sky went ballistic. And there was a massive campaign. They refused to pay the tolls, and the, 
campaign went on for several years, and then eventually the Scottish government said, okay, okay, we'll buy out. We bought out, uh, uh, it's a buyout in classic sense, but con in that sense, the contractor got 29 million quid, a lump sum, um, and that's what it cost the Scottish government to do that, which reflected what the value of, of the equipment the rest of the value of, of, of that contract and the you know, other costs that were short associated with that. Okay, uh, well, yes, yes, Stuart. Yeah, I just wanted to <coughs> say about this issue of the buyout um, and about how, could it, how can they get the money if you know, you're not getting the services over the long run. Um, I think you've got to think of it in two ways. One is that in a negotiation of a buyout, if, if the context is favourable to the contractor, then they're going to get their money back. The context is unfavourable to the contractor, caused by huge political and also kind of financial problems with the contract, then the contractor might be interested in, in a deal. So it's not just a straightforward buyout or termination, it's a negotiated exit. And that is possible, where they're losing money or they're not making as much profit as they thought. It's a huge risk. They're not going to find anyone easy to, to maybe sell the equity on because of potential risks of future profits. So in a way, politics can shape the negotiation. The more toxic the contract becomes politically and financially, the more the, you know, the odds are stacked more in the favor of a favorable buyout or termination deal. So it's not a case that it's just what's written down will happen. Because in this process of buying out or terminating, it's an interpretation of poor performance, an interpretation of um, breaking the contract. Um, the council could put down on a table, you know, 200 pages of contract defaulting evidence. And the, the other side might come back and say, well, there's 100 pages of you, you, you're, you were liable for some of these 200 pages because you didn't stop them stopping us going, doing the tree, cutting the trees down. Then you have a negotiation with lawyers. You have a dispute. You could go into dispute anyway, dispute resolution procedure which could lead to an agreement to basically both sides walk away from the contract. And it's not straightforwardly, it depends, the deal will be, you know, how it all plays out. So, so it's, not, it's not necessarily a bad thing to buy out. Also, the public sector is effectively refinancing that, con it's refinancing by borrowing the money to buy out the contract. And at current interest rates, it can still potentially claw back some money, which could pay for the future services that you're not getting from the contract now. So again, it's not, it's not a zero option, it depends on the context. But the, if you stop campaigning and think there's going to be a buyout, there won't be a buyout. Mm. I mean, it, actually, I, just one second, I just should, should actually introduce Stuart. Stuart Hutchinson is a geographer from Reeds University. He gave a speech, a uh, talk, sorry, yeah, about three weeks ago in Sheffield. And he's in fact going to come on as the double act here in a few minutes. And he's going to tell us about how to monitor a PFI contract. Uh, Stuart's field has been on housing PFIs, which are s somewhat different than these kinds of things, but some of the basic principles of keep sort of kicking on their ass yeah. is, is quite, there's a lot of uh, yeah. similarities. So, um, I'm, I'm just 20 to 9, uh, any other, did you have a question, Justin, or you're okay? Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Can I just have, just have a quick one? Sure, sure. So, I'm, I'm just out of the loop. Why, do you know why it is that the council wants to stay in bed with Amy? Why they don't want to dispute themselves? Yeah. Because? Because ending a contract is a nightmare for a council. That's what the sector was saying. The reason for the nationalisation proposals is it, it takes, you know, 712 individual contract yeah. problems and puts it back into a national political resolution whereby the public sector then becomes but on both sides of the of the contract and to start to renegotiate the bits of the contract that we all think are crap. Or 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 again, you know, get a better deal or refinance or whatever. So that's why it's, a, it's an ingenious idea. I mean, the nationalization idea is a, is, is a brilliant idea because for years we've all been thinking, how do you solve this problem? And this is a way of not it avoids all of this politics of buying out all the PFI contracts, which is a terrible idea because it costs a huge amount of money and can't afford it. But it's a way into doing it. But if they're oh. performing so poorly, why aren't yeah. we doing it down the contract termination route? And I totally take the point. Yeah. It requires a lot of work to do that. But that, that isn't costly. That isn't, I mean, it's not as costly as a contract buyout. Justin will now give us 30 seconds on why, why Sheffield City Council is so in bed with Amy. 
Uh, well, I was just going to, your original question that you brought up, I was going to say, um, the motivation for the, the council not pursuing termination or uh, rescinding the contract that we tried to force them to do earlier this year is that the officers have that much um, complacency, negligence to cover up that they won't even consider. And of course, the, the councillors, we all know that councillors are run by the officers because mm. the councillors haven't got two brain cells to go. <laughs> I'm talking about the ruling, <laughs> the ruling group. <laughs> um, but yes, so um, the, there are sort of straightforward, logical arguments for doing things, but within that, there are the, the deep politics of, of what's happening in the council. I'm just a little bit worried about time now. Yeah, okay. uh, Dexter, uh, when are we going to bring in Stuart? After what I talk about strategies. And okay, then... strategies and then monitoring with Stuart. Yeah. Um, well. We can do this very quickly. I mean, again, it's, I'm trying, this slide, I'm trying to reinforce um, that um, the cause is, if you look at the cause, and it goes back to, you know, the evidence in that report and what's happened to the additional ones, um, these are just some of the, 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 the problems. They're not, um, uh, they're all substantial issues. And they're substantial issues that have to be, in many cases, Created, they may not exist now, or they may exist only in, in, in to agree about that. For example, poor performance, quite clearly, and there are different perspectives around that. But it's it, it's the it it. I come back to the point that yes, every contract that's written, in, in, in my view, every local authority, the local authority will defend the contractor initially. They do that because if you, if they if they say well we're just signing you know two billion contracts and you know year in they say well that's a pile of crap <laughs> <laughs> who's going to politically who's going to do that <laughs> and even the small co cleaning contracts they're, oh no no they're all right yeah we'll, we'll keep with them you know it's a, of course they're not going to do that you've got to force it's a political battle you've got to force their hand and. I know it might, be, it's, it might be really hard now saying to think that, you know, that Sheffield City Council for the next 19 years is going to be, remain in the same relationship as it has now with Amy over that period. As I said, I don't think that will happen. I'd be very surprised if that, that happens. And what's happened in lots of other places was that things change. This contract has changed already in those, you know, Five years, initial five years, um, and you know other things will happen as well. And some of these things we've got to like, we've got to highlight that poor, poor performance. Um, and basically, my point here is it's the combination of you know the contractor highlighting that poor performance and financial losses. It's about the council, you know, identifying cost savings and in a sense of political need that it does have to improve the quality of service because this poor performance reflects on the council um, and it's also about building community and trade union opposition that's how you you know which goes on to my final thing which is about action strategies and i don't know this is not this is not a shopping list but it's a, it's, a, it's a set of ideas and um, strategies which are necessary if you want to get to a point where that contract it becomes much more vulnerable, you build opposition to it, um, and um, you know, it's about you know, you know, building alliances with community organizations. In my view, you may totally disagree, you probably will disagree with me. That cannot be done by the tree campaign alone. I know you probably think that you, that's possible, but in my view, if you look at what's happened in other local authorities, 
it is not just one part of a contract that forces the termination of that, of that contract. It's about how you build you know, alliances with people with different interests, community organizations, tennis associations, political organizations, civil society organizations, whatever. It's how you build a you know, progression of the movement where people agree with you and will support that campaign. And it's about building political and public support you know, for that. And um, it is about you know disclosing the book, the performance, the exploitation, the things that you know that um, Anna said at the very beginning. The whole raft of different uh, uh, part of that agenda that could be de developed both in terms of what uh, Isabel has in terms of that the graphic. You could take that and do it in terms of tax. You could take it in terms of you know poor performance within Sheffield and so on. And if it has the idea of the audit. Um, I think is is fantastic, but the audit is is the public audit is a great idea, but um, I would say well where is it, and and you know I haven't seen anything about a public audit, and but the idea of that which is in a sense exposing what's happening in what's happened to the roads and what's happened to other things at the moment, Amy's got it easy they just they haven't in a sense confront the trees. But whatever they do on the roads and all the other places, nobody's going to say, nobody's saying anything. And so, you know, it's about how you, you know, how you do that. And it's about take, continuing that directness, action, and, and, and so on. And also, it's about that final point as well. When I talk about developing local environmental demands and plans, it's about using the tree issue is it's not just about the trees it's about making local environment and demands and how that links into neighborhood local plans neighborhood plans and to actually develop alternatives it's to try to turn the thing on its head it's, but, you know they're destroying something but what should be there and it's about you know moving from a defensive position of saying don't touch the effing trees <laughs> you know it's about saying well you know, how do we how do we develop a strategy? What do we want to happen? In you know on a local basis. And that is that's got all kinds of potential for engaging schools and school kids, all kinds of different organizations into that thing about how you make a local area better, better quality, which isn't just about the trees, but about that wider environment. And that is an area that the council won't want to, you know. Well, uh, uh, so interesting, but basically that would mean spending more money. It's about developing a strategy. It's about ownership of, of that kind of strategy, and it's you know, um, it's not something Amy wants to touch and won't want to touch. Um, and so it's about finding other ways of doing things, as well as doing the, the basic um, uh, uh, tactics of how you develop further. Say more okay, I want to suggest now that Stuart come up here and give his little section. Of I think the key thing that, um, that I wanted to um, get across to you was the idea that there is a there is a step by step process to contract monitoring. And just to sort of briefly explain, you know, why contract monitoring is very useful. There's a number of reasons. The first is that contract monitoring is one of the best ways of, of, of developing and generating the evidence that you need for all of those options that Bex uh, outlined. Termination, buyout, um, the nationalisation strategy, um, <clears throat> renegotiations. They all they all depend actually on pressure from below. And the pressure from below is going to come from um, a lot of evidence being generated, being pushed onto the local authority, and also onto other regulatory bodies and central government as well, onto ministers, that this contract or these contracts are demonstrably failing. So in order to generate that evidence, um, one, of the, one of the best ways of doing it is to actually take the contract at face value as if the contract, um, it's not, it won't be well written, it'll have all kinds of flaws in it, and those are the kind of things you also want to show. But let's imagine that you wanted to actually 
enforce that contract as a as a as a as a local um, a group of people in, in Sheffield. The first thing you need is you need to get hold of that contract. So my question to you first of all is: Has anyone got the contract? Has anyone got any part of the contract whatsoever? We don't. What others? Sorry, others. No, not now. <laughs> no, 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 no,
get, get a really good understanding of, of kind of the most, most important part of the contract to you as, as service users, as citizens, as people in your, in your everyday localities. You can get, you can read that contract and what it means to you and the inconveniences of, of Amy in everyday life. And then you can start to just, as part of, part of your everyday um, schedule, going to work, taking, walking the dog, maybe picking up the kids or the grandkids, you can just start to monitor Amy. And then you can file a report. And it's very simple to do. You just send an email off, you copy in a lot of people, and then you, you wait for you know, some kind of response. And you just log it. You just keep it there. And one of the ways that I, I've been working with residents, what, 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 how we do it, is that we might create a shared um, Google document or a shared uh, Excel spreadsheet, or we might just, we share some kind of online document where we're logging all of these kinds of visual, visual unavailability of a contract, visual um, defaults on the contract. And then we're putting huge pressure on the contractor and the council to make good these problems. And then we're following the money, effectively from that moment to them being paid, to the invoices every month, we're following the money all the way through to start to evidence the fact that even with all of the evidence that people are providing to the council and to the contractor, they're pretending that they've done the work, they're paying themselves the full amount, and that's when you start to get into the issue of making a big kind of public declaration of uh, fraud, because that's what it is, it's fraud. Um, you, can, you can cause a stink at the annual, um, during the annual accounts, when you can actually raise multiple objections to the accounts and you can cause the accounts not to be signed off by the auditor, um, which is obviously means that the auditor, which I don't know who Shemel's auditor is, KPMG, yeah. price what KPMG will be paid, unfortunately, um, to investigate on, um, on your behalf. Um, but it's very important because doing that actually starts to raise the profile of the contract, and it starts to actually get more and more people interested. And the other thing I would say about the monitoring is that when you start to look at the outcome specification, you start to see this contract is not just about trees or roads or whatever. It's, it's, it's about all kinds of things to do with the highways and the maintenance. There's so much of it that you can actually monitor. And there's so much of it that, that, that the council is unable to monitor, will not monitor, but also the PFI contractors themselves are not, are not able to monitor and will not monitor because monitoring costs money. And they're, not, they're going to try to cut as much, as much corners and as much cost as possible in order to maximize the profits. So in terms of the steps, step one obviously is trying to is keep trying to pull out as much of this contract as possible. So in terms of FOI requests and so on, um, you've got you've got free information. You've also got um, the Environmental Information Regulations 2004, which is a stronger a stronger FOI route. Um, there's they they are not they have it's strong. It's, it gives basically more. Um, it gives more weight to public requests for information about environmental type of work, which is definitely coming from this contract. You also want to kind of, um, and yes, they're going to say no. They're going to say it's commercially confidential. Well, has anyone yet um, taken the, taken um, what they've said and gone back to the Information Commissioner's office and appealed against the refusal? They want to appeal, right? right. Okay, great. <laughs> right. And so, what, where, where did that go? The Information Commissioner sided with the contractor um, and the council, or with, or with? Well, they turn both ways. Way. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, again, you know, look for look for precedents where where other contracts have been disclosed that are very similar, and where the information commissioner has actually ruled in favour. Because what we found is that it, it, it depends on who you get on behalf of the commission. The commissioner will appoint um, a legal representative on their behalf, and if that legal representative is in minded or is interpreting the rules in a particular way, you don't get the contract. If you happen to get a different person on a different day, and you put a slightly different argument, and you put a loads of evidence and precedent in, you might get more of the contract on appeal. Um, the other thing is you also don't need that particular contract if you can find other versions of different contracts of similar kinds of schemes elsewhere, to, to kind of guess what's going on. Also, has anyone asked for the outline and full business case of um, contract? The, the kind of pre, the procurement documentation of the contract. Well, we've got the um, outline specifications uh, given to the DFT. Okay, so you've got the, the business cases put to the government. Yeah, it's, it's pretty sketchy. It's pretty sketchy, right. Um, one thing to ask for is the final business case or the full business case because that contains a huge amount of very relevant information, um, which is just before they'll sign the contract. That's the final business case. They contain a lot of very useful financial information, but it will also contain um, stuff that you can use. Actually, you can then start to politicize and publicize 
what's in there compared to again what what, what you're getting. That that document often makes a lot of promises to government about how well Sheffield will monitor the contract. <laughs> all the all the procedures it's putting in place to ensure that value for money will flow from the contract. And you, all you need to do is quote that, to take some pictures of some very poor work being done, and again it, it really helps to kind of you know raise the profile. The other thing to look for and to ask for, again you might be doing it, is to freedom of make a FOI request for the monthly performance reports and the monthly invoices that the PFI contractor sends to the council. So, so every month the contractor will make a self-declared statement of its self-monitored performance and self-monitored availability. Yes. Perhaps you could have a query that I've got. It's a unitary payment. Yeah, the unitary, the unitary payment, yeah. So we're getting indications from the council that it doesn't actually matter what the what key performance indicators are being achieved. Trust me. It's a new twist on our wellness on it. Yeah. Doesn't matter. This is, this is this is coming from councillors, yeah. so you know you can take it with a pinch of salt. So that means that well that means that the contract's not worth anything because <laughs> if the KPIs yeah, don't matter. Yeah. That there's no point having a contract. The KPIs are part of their service, their service delivery promises. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the yeah. feeling we're getting, or I'm getting anyway, is, is, is that the unitary charge will just go on and on and on yeah. until the end of a period, and then they'll make adjustments. Yes, they'll make the adjustments based on based period. on. Yes. But what they're saying is that it's a constant payment until that time, and then the adjustment is made. Well, I don't know how, I don't know whether the payments are being made on the monthly basis, but what happens is that they, they put an invoice in, and then they'll invoice two, for two months previously, they'll, they'll make an admission that there were some deductions that were over two months ago, and there's an adjustment over the year, yes. But the KPIs, if, if they're not meeting the, like, the basic KPIs, then that amounts to a deduction. It does not often amount to a big deduction, but if you've got a lot of a lot of little things, you should see the um, the equation that they use for adjusting the agreement. Can I suggest we don't get back into that? Because I, can imagine that. Can imagine I think we do need to start to wrap yeah, up because yeah. it's uh, almost ten after nine. Yeah. So um, those those monthly invoices are useful because if they're showing no deductions, then again that's very important for politically for you to publicise the fact that. Here's, here's evidence of them not delivering on the output specification, and here's no deductions being levied. And we told the council for the last year that this is a poor performance. That also puts the council in the dock on this issue, and again, puts pressure on them. Um, so, study the contracts. Obviously, that's the next step to study the contracts, which I'm sure you're doing. And I, I can, again, I'm really happy to help yeah. with that. And one example I just want to give you is what I did with tenants in Islington. We, we got hold of a large part of the contract and we used the output specification and we matched the output specification with its vague, with its very vague sort of promises with um, information that was provided in, in different forums about what cyclical maintenance would look like in Islington. So you've got these listed buildings, these uh, 200 year old uh, uh, council houses that were municipalised in the 60s and 70s and these are the listed buildings and they need to have maintenance work done every five to seven years to keep those buildings in a, in a good state of repair on the outside. And the council, um, and, and, it, and the contractor, sorry, promised that every five to seven years they would be repainted. Every property in this meeting would be repainted. So what we did was we, we asked the council, we made an FOI request, for all of the addresses of every single property that had been declared fully available um, before 2007 and then we, we, we added seven years onto that and then we went around the area it took six months to get this information back from the council they, they said no this is no this is no then we got the information we made a map we went around the area and we just took photographs of every single house every single house and there were hundreds of them and guess what you can't see it on the unfortunately you can't see it on there because google shit <laughs> but if you if you manage to get hold of this and I'll send it to you, you'll see. And the person that did this printout for me also needs to be must be a PFI contractor because it's so badly printed out. But you'll see that there are pictures of some of the state of the repair of the building. There hadn't even been a, a lick of paint the first time round, let alone the second time round. And they were invoicing. They're invoicing. Um, it every year, for millions and millions of pounds, and they're not doing the work. And the council's got three and a half people, two of them sit in an office, 
one of them goes out and, and inspects about 20 or 30 properties a year. That's the monitoring that takes place. Yeah. So this campaign in about six months evidenced the, the how, how hundreds of homes are basically being left to rot. While, while, and then with Dexter's work, we, had, we basically matched it all up. We, we saw all this profit, all these dividends, all these interest payments going to the banks, to the equity holders, to the Guernsey and Jerseys and the Cayman Islands. We saw no deductions being made in the invoices and looking at the, in the accounts. And we saw the, the properties rotting. And we saw you know millions of pounds of payments going out every year. No accountability, no monitoring. But within six months, what, what the residents did was they then put brochures of all these streets. They called them the street tours. PFI street tours, streets of shame. Um, they did Halloween special. They made postcards, you know, with, with to councillors in the streets where the councillors lived or with the councillors represented. And they basically went actually after the ruling Labour group. And in terms of what Dex was saying before, Dex was saying things can change. He's right because the new head of um, housing, the current, the, the, the former council lead for housing, is now the advisor to City Khan. The current head of housing, the councillor, has said in a scrutiny meeting the other day, I think we all accept that this contract is a disaster. We, 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 we would love it to end tomorrow, and we can't wait for the contract to end, because quite frankly, they tell us that they're 90%, 95% KPI is successful. It's the, it's the 20 to 30% of the long-term um, tenant cases that we've got that are in our post bags that we are worrying about, and we know for a fact they're just basically telling lies to us the whole time. And this is now the head the head of housing for Islington Council, who's saying that their own PFI contract, that only two years ago was saying, there's no problem with this contract, it's been an absolute magnificent success, they're now saying it's a disaster. Yeah. But they're also saying, we can't get out from it. And I think it'll only be a couple more years when they say, yeah, we can get out from it, and it'll be someone in power saying we're gonna nationalize SPVs, <laughs> and Islington Council and presenting all this evidence that citizens have been you know, gathering together over the last few years. Where is Corbin from again? It's Linton. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So, so, we are now at, at 9.13. I do, you know, it's been going on for two hours and 15 minutes. Um, I think there actually is all kinds of things we can do. Uh, you know, like, for example, Amy Ferrovio, uh, you know, got an attack on their public relations. You know, the trees, there's so many kinds of things, tax havens, you know, uh, the people's audit hasn't done too much, though, yet. It is very slow, yeah. Very slow, like, do we have to give that some, some, Support. yeah, pump up, yes. you know, but I think so, that, yes. I think, you know, because I asked Helen, what have you got after four months? Well, we've got one mm. little thing, you know, what, we need, like, some more stuff, and I think there's lots of possibilities, and it's working in Islington, so let's have it work in Sheffield. Yeah. Thanks a lot, then. And come to the, on the 7th of November over at Church. <laughs>